This morning, uh, we are looking at uh, Mark's gospel. As you know, this is what we've been working our way through. And we did take a few weeks off, a couple weeks while our family was on vacation. Of course, last week when we had an evangelistic service. But now after, uh, I guess it's four weeks, we're returning to uh, Mark's gospel. And currently, we're in chapter 8. And we're going to be looking at verses 27 through 30. But as I mentioned, I think it was perhaps last week in, in some context, either the morning or the uh, evening, uh, this is really... Uh, one of the synoptic gospels, which means that it, it's one of three that gives to us different accounts of the same events and teachings from our Lord Jesus Christ, which means that, that this account we're looking at this morning doesn't occur only here, but it also occurs in the other gospels. And I'm going to be drawing from at least Matthew's gospel to fill out this account. So some of the things we're going to be looking at as a matter of fact, the main theme that I'm focusing on isn't actually in this reading, but it is in Matthew's gospel uh, added to this, which means that when Mark wrote what he did, he simply left that particular part out, but Jesus actually did say what Matthew records. But let's read this now in Mark chapter 8, verses 27 through 30. And Jesus went out along with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he questioned his disciples, saying to them, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, saying, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, but others one of the prophets. And he continued by questioning, questioning them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said to him, You are the Christ. And he warned them to tell no one about him. Of course, the part that's missing is uh, uh, where Peter goes on to say, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus turns to him and says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now, again, we have been studying the gospel of Mark for some time, and last time we did consider miracles. It really is a picture of what the Lord does when he saves an individual. We're going to be looking at more direct teaching about that this morning. But it was when Jesus opened the eyes of the blind, a blind man in particular. Now, Jesus, we know, healed many blind people. There's nothing unique about that. But in this particular healing, it was progressive. The Lord spits on his eyes. And, of course, we saw why the Lord might have done that in earlier uh, healing when he spit on his finger and touched a man's tongue with it. It was perhaps condescension to that particular individual uh, because spittle was sometimes used in a medicinal way, although we wouldn't use it that way today. And also because, again, how spittle may represent the word of the Lord, which is able to do things spiritually as the Lord speaks and opens the eyes of the blind spiritually through his gospel. So he may, through spittle, represent that by applying it to the eyes. So he spit on the man's eyes, and he laid hands on him. And the man's eyes were opened, but not fully, not clearly. He could see men walking, but only as trees. So then the Lord Jesus laid hands on him again, and this time his sight was restored. Now we ask the question, why did Jesus heal a man in two steps when he could have just as easily done it in one? Well, it's most likely because Jesus was teaching us something about his kingdom. When the Lord opens your eyes to the truth, to his spiritual kingdom, he doesn't open them to everything at one time. Sanctification is progressive. That is, growth in holiness is something that takes a period of time. And as the Lord works with you throughout your life, he progressively opens your eyes to greater depths of his truth and to greater views of his glory. Sanctification is a progressive work. God is at work with us both to will and to do of his good pleasure, and it does take time. We don't become spiritually mature overnight. Now, that was important for a couple of reasons. First of all, because the younger you are in the Lord's, and the less you know and the less experienced you are, the less 
the Lord actually expects from you. And I think that can be important because sometimes as young Christians, we tend to kick ourselves all the time because we're not doing what others are doing, uh, those who are more mature. And we think there's some deficiency in us. But would a toddler kick himself because he's not able to run a four-minute mile? Uh, would, uh, would he kick himself for not being able to uh, long jump, maybe 24 feet? He's just not old enough. He's not developed enough. And we shouldn't expect ourselves to do more than we actually are able to do when we're young in the Lord. But certainly, as you continue to grow, and the Lord expects you to grow, He commands you to grow, He exhorts you to grow, He will expect more from you. Now, likewise, when you're ministering to other people, you need to remember not to expect too much from them, especially when they are young, uh, whether physically young, as we just mentioned in the case of the toddler, or spiritually young. Sometimes we get a little bit uh, too impatient with uh, young Christians, and we want them to do more. We want them to behave differently. We want them to grow up. And certainly the Lord wants that too, but again, we need to help them grow in the way that Jesus helped his disciples to grow. Jesus wasn't out there kicking them and hitting them and, and uh, criticizing them constantly because they didn't measure up to where he was, but rather he was always encouraging them, coming alongside of them, helping them to grow into that yoke as, um, uh, well, that, that Jesus was placing upon them. And again, that reminds us that we need to make sure that we don't place too heavy a yoke on the necks, either of our children or of young converts. We must not expect maturity from those who are under age. Now again, in that miracle, we saw two things happen. We saw the Lord open the eyes, and we saw him clarify that vision. Now that was just through this, this miracle. And we say that there are spiritual parallels to what happens in the physical realm. Actually, this morning we're going to see the Lord speak about it more directly, how exactly it is he opens the eyes to reveal to his children things they need to see in order to be saved. This sight doesn't come from man. It comes directly from the Father through the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, as we look at our text, we need to realize that by this time, Jesus was becoming very well known in all of Palestine and all of Israel. Many were talking about him, talking about the things he said, talking about the things that he had done, formulating ideas as to who this one might actually be. And Jesus, of course, knew that, what, that they were talking about him, and they knew, he knew what they were thinking. And he was also aware of how the Father was working through the things he was doing in the lives of his disciples. And so being aware of the chatter that was going on around him and being, of course, concerned about what his disciples thought, he takes this opportunity to question them, not only as to what others thought, but as to what they thought in order to teach them a very important lesson. First of all, he asked what others thought. And they answered, some say, you are John the Baptist. Well, certainly we've already seen that that's what Herod thought. Uh, the Herod who had John arrested, the Herod who had John uh, executed, he thought that John was raised again to life, and that's why miraculous powers were at work in him. Apparently, Herod wasn't the only one who thought this. He was convincing, apparently. Others believed the same thing. Others, the disciple thought, said that you are Elijah. Now, Elijah was another of the Old Covenant prophets. I say another besides John the Baptist because that's what he was. Elijah was one who was known for his powerful miracles. Just read the Old Testament, the book of Kings, and you'll see the accounts of those miracles. Well, Jesus performed miracles. He was doing these mighty acts to show that God was, in fact, present in him. Now, the Lord had said also through Malachi, the last of the Old Testament prophets besides John, that he would send Elijah before the great and powerful day of the Lord. Some thought perhaps Jesus was Elijah. 
Now, if you followed this, uh, le- this study through Mark to this point, you realize it wasn't Jesus that Malachi was referring to, but it was, in fact, John the Baptist. He is the one who came as the forerunner of our Lord Jesus Christ to prepare the way for him. Well, if not Elijah, perhaps, as uh, the parallel account in Matthew says, perhaps Jeremiah or one of the other prophets, uh, not because of any specific predictions, because of them, or the Lord certainly didn't give them those predictions, but again, because of the mighty deeds that these prophets did and what Jesus was doing. Now, one thing that the disciples neglected to mention as far as the opinions that people had was that of the Pharisees. What did they think about Jesus? He was in league with the devil. Of course, they knew that that could never be true. They knew who Jesus was. But again, now, Jesus didn't ask this question because he was so much interested in what people thought. He really wanted to know what his own disciples were thinking. And so he asked them this question, but who do you say that I am? And of course, by you there, he means all of you. What do you, my disciples, think? Peter answers first, as Peter often does, this time not to stick his foot in his mouth, but actually to say something that is good, something that is right. And I think when he answers this question, he is actually answering it for them all. He says, you are the Christ. And Matthew adds that Peter also says, the son of the living God. Now, certainly Jesus already knew that they knew this, that they were aware of that, or that that they were aware that he was the Messiah, and he was pleased by that. He's also going to go on to talk about exactly how they knew that, but let's, let's finish this last point. He warned them, realizing that, not to tell anyone, and I think sometimes we have a difficult time when we come to passages like this, and we say, why, when Jesus is doing everything that he's doing, when he is preaching, when he's teaching, when he's performing miracles, so that people will know that he's the Messiah, why does he tell his disciples not to tell anyone else that he is, in fact, the Messiah? Well, again, it's because of the condition of Israel. It's because of what the people would do with that knowledge, because what happens when they actually do find out that he is the Messiah, when it comes out of the closet, as it were, so fully, when he presents himself as the Messiah, before Israel on that uh, day when he comes riding on the donkey, what happens? Well, they immediately plot to do away with him, to, to kidnap him by secret, to put him on trial, and then to execute him, to have him crucified. At this point in Jesus' ministry, it was not the right time. There was still much that he had to do. He had to do this work of the Messiah. He had to preach what Messiah was to preach. But in a large way, he still wanted to keep this secret so that it wouldn't escalate the hatred against him, especially by the Jewish leaders who would want to put him to death. But let's return now again to that question of what everyone thought about Jesus and what the disciples thought about Jesus and why. Now, at this point in his ministry, most people still had a very high opinion of him, except for the Pharisees, of course. Some thought he was John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. That's very flattering. That's a a very high opinion. But the disciples knew that he was the Messiah. They knew who he really was. The people were mistaken. How did the disciples know this? Well, Mark doesn't really tell us, but Matthew does in his account. After Peter answered again, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, Jesus says to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Now, Jesus had not really made his identity too widely known. Again, if we compare all the gospels, we find out that John the Baptist had pointed him out earlier. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He knew that he was sent before the Messiah to prepare his way. He knew that Jesus was the Messiah. Although we do find him later questioning whether he was. Are you the expected one or should we look for someone else? Apparently there was still some question in his mind. Jesus revealed himself to the woman at the well of Samaria. She says, I know when Messiah comes, he will reveal all these things to us. Jesus says to her, I who speak to you am he. 
Jesus was doing the works of the Messiah. He was certainly preaching as Messiah would preach, heralding the gospel and healing. As uh, I think Greg did a series of sermons on the very things Messiah would do, and that is what Jesus was doing. So he was doing those works. Now, again, not everybody heard John. and Certainly very few people heard what Jesus had to say to the woman at the well of Samaria, and the Jews had nothing to do with the Samaritans, so there wasn't much conversation going that direction. But yet, they heard Jesus, they saw what he was doing, they were drawing their conclusions regarding him, some flattering, not so flattering. But in the middle of all these varied opinions, the disciples had this settled conviction. You were the Messiah. How did they know these things? And why were they so certain about them? Well, again, it wasn't because any man told them that this was true. It was because the Father had revealed it to them. Now, here's a diagnostic question for you this morning. What do you think about Jesus? Who do you really believe that he is? Is he somebody that somebody made up, a group of people called the church made up years ago and, and sort of been propagating this myth, this legend all these years? Is, is he, was he somebody who really existed, who was just merely a good teacher, a good moral teacher, as many of the liberals believe? and that his life was simply embellished by the church? Is he a prophet among other prophets, but no more than a mere man? Or is he, in fact, the Messiah, the one who is God and man? Now, if you understand that's, that's who he is, and you have received him as your Lord and your Savior, then you need to realize that this is not something that you did because of you. It's not something that you believed because somebody told it to you but rather it's something that the Father has revealed to you. Now, in light of this, I want us to consider two things this morning. And the first thing is simply this, and these are applicatory points. You can only learn so much about Jesus Christ from others. That's the first point. Flesh and blood can only go so far in the work of the gospel. But secondly, the Father must reveal His Son to you or to anyone else if they are to be saved. <clears throat> so what we want to look at are the limitations of man and the absolute necessity of the fathers intervening by, with, with his Holy Spirit to grant the gift of the new birth. If a person is actually to see and believe who Jesus Christ is and embrace him as the Messiah, the Son of God. Now, first of all, you can only learn so much about Jesus from others. Jesus says in Matthew 16, 17, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. And by flesh and blood, of course, he means others or men. There is only so much you can learn from other people. There is only so much that you can learn about Jesus Christ on your own. Again, just consider all the varied opinions about Jesus Christ throughout Israel among those who saw him, among those who heard him, among those who saw the miracles that he was performing. Most of them still had no idea as to who he was. What you come into the world with, what they came into the world with by nature, can only take you so far in the kingdom of heaven. There are certain things that you can understand about Jesus Christ, certain facts that you can learn. Anybody can pick up their Bible and read it. And they can even believe, you can believe, that these things that you read are true. And the things that other Christians tell you about Jesus Christ are also true about Him. Now, unlike the people in Jesus' day, you can even know that Jesus is the Messiah. That isn't necessarily a saving thing to be able to recognize that because in those days it was hidden, at least largely from a number of people. But now you can read about it in the Bible just like you could anything else about Jesus Christ. But there is still something that you cannot know by reading and that you cannot learn by listening to others, something you need to know if you are to be saved, something that no one in the world, at least no man, no woman, can show you, but something only the Father can teach you if you are to be saved. Now, likewise, there's only so much that you can do to bring Jesus Christ to others. I mean, as Christians, 
as those who have come to know who Jesus is and have trusted Jesus, we want other people to learn about Jesus as well. We want them to be saved. We want them to come. Well, there's only so much you can do to help a person come. Uh, you, certainly, you can tell them the truth. Uh, that's what the Lord wants you to do. You can tell them the truth if you know the truth. And certainly, if you're a Christian, you should know the truth. And certainly, as a Christian, you can study it. And you can refine your understanding until you know it well. And certainly, as a believer, you should also work on making that truth as plain and as understandable as you possibly can to others. Well, that's not all you can do. You can also live before others as an example of Christ. You can speak to them in a way that really shows that you believe what you're saying is true and that you are acting upon it. Because if you don't look like you're convinced, and if you don't live as though you believe these things are true, you can't really expect them to believe it either. But realizing that even if you do these things, realize it's still not enough. There's more that needs to be done. The gospel, the Bible says, is the power of God to salvation. But many people make the mistake of thinking that the power is contained in the words themselves. If I can just say the right words, this person's going to be saved. Or that somehow it's the way that I say it. Uh, Charles Finney was, was famous slash infamous for believing that this was true. That if he could just speak it in, in a way that was convincing enough, that he could get people to come to Christ. But he also realized that that's the way they come to Christ. They can just as easily fall away when they cease to be convinced that those things are true. Now, you need to realize that the power of the gospel does not come from you. It's something that you can only use outwardly. We talk about the outward call of the gospel. I can take and I can call somebody to faith and repentance through the gospel, but that is an outward call. You can only teach people so much. You can only move their hearts so far by your appeals by your convictions, by the way that you live. Something more needs to take place. They need something more before they're actually going to come to Christ. And that something more, you already realize what it is from what we've seen. The Father has to reveal His Son to you or to others if you are to be saved. Now, you need to be called outwardly by the gospel. You need to hear the gospel. You need to bring the gospel to others. But the Lord needs to issue the inward call if you or anyone else is going to come to Christ. He must reveal himself to you. Now listen to what Jesus said to his disciples on that occasion. When he sent them out to preach throughout Israel the gospel of Christ, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When they returned, this is what Jesus said. At that very time, he rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit and said, I praise you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this was well-pleasing in your sight. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal Him. Now, I hope you were able to follow along that passage. By the way, that was Luke chapter 10, verses 21 and 22. Jesus says the Father must reveal the Son before the Son may be known. But this is something that the Father was hiding from the wise and intelligent but revealed it to babes. He goes on to say that the Son must also reveal the Father if the Father is to be known by anyone. They must teach you. They must draw you spiritually. Jesus says in John chapter 6, verses 44 through 45, no one can come to me. He doesn't say no one may come to me as though it's a matter of permission because the Lord does in fact command everyone to come to him, but he says no one can 
No one is able to come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. Notice what he says next. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Again, Jesus says to Peter, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Now, the reason why we need the Father to make this revelation to us, uh, to teach you, is because you can't learn it for yourself, because by nature you are blind. There are things that you cannot see because of the sin of Adam, because of the fall. The Bible says your heart is darkened by sin. You are blind to the beauty and the glory of God. Apart from God's grace, you might be able to understand some things, but you cannot see these things in such a way as to draw your heart out to them and to cause you to want to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, it's kind of like missing one of your five senses. I think this is probably the best way to, to understand this. If you were blind, could you possibly understand what color is if you were unable to see it? And if you were trying to explain color to a person who is blind, what point of reference could you possibly use to help them understand what color is? The same thing I think holds true with regard to your hearing. Let's say you're deaf. Can a deaf person understand what melody is or what harmony is, what music is, if you could never really hear it? But if you could see color, you would know what it is immediately. As I look around and I see all the different colors, you, you see what it is. It's something you have to see with that particular sense. When I hear music, when you hear it, when you hear melody and harmony, you, you recognize it because you have the sense to understand it. But now here is something that people come into the world with a sense, or at least lacking the sense, to be able to understand. They can't really see these spiritual things they cannot understand them. Jesus says they are spiritually discerned. And unless the Lord gives you that ability to see it, which is what he calls teaching or revealing or drawing, unless he gives you that ability to appreciate who he is, to see what he is, to see that glory, you will never really be able to see it or to understand it because flesh and blood cannot reveal it to you. Only God can. And by the way, this, this is a hard point for many to accept. The Bible says that the Lord does not give that to everyone. Now, again, the same thing holds true to you when you try to bring other people to Jesus Christ. Realize that you are asking a blind person to see color. You're asking a deaf person to hear music and to understand what those things mean. You're asking those who are spiritually blind to understand and appreciate something that they have no faculty to see. Now, your job is not to get them to see it. Your job is simply to bring them the gospel in a way that they can understand, perhaps to convince them or at least to show them the evidence that God exists, to tell them the gospel that God sent his son to die for sinners. You need to do what you can to help them see their danger but you need to realize that God has to reveal his son to them. If they are to be saved, he must open their eyes by his Holy Spirit. And this is exactly what he does when and where he wills by his Holy Spirit. I was going to read for you a passage from John chapter 3. Perhaps we'd all do well to turn there just momentarily. When Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus, we often uh, read this and we understand that there, there needs to be the new birth that needs to take place before a person can, uh, well, actually, most people believe that the new birth takes place after they believe. But Jesus here is saying the new birth must take place before they can see the kingdom of heaven, before they can enter into the kingdom of heaven. Most people believe today the new birth actually takes place after they've seen the kingdom and after they've entered into the kingdom. They've already believed. They've already trusted in Jesus, though they are dead in trespass and sin, according to what the Bible says. 
But once they believe they're born again, Jesus says here to Nicodemus, you have to be born again before you can see and before you can enter into the kingdom of heaven. Let's begin in verse 1 of John chapter 3. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to him by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Well, at least Nicodemus had a good opinion. Whether he thought he was the Messiah or not, we don't know. But he heard what he had to say. He saw what he had done. He says, we know you're from God. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, cannot see it. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now notice Jesus says you have to be born of the Spirit before you can see the kingdom of God. I mean, see what about the kingdom of God? I mean, since you've been born of the Spirit, have you seen the gates? And have you seen the building? Can you look into heaven and see some sort of a city circling the earth? That's not what he's talking about. But he's talking about seeing the kingdom in Jesus Christ and desiring it. You cannot do that unless you were born again. Nicodemus thought he was talking about being born a second time in the natural way that he came into this world. Jesus said, you have to come into the world by water, which means you have to be born into this world naturally but you must also be born of the Spirit. If you are not born of the Spirit, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So how can a person enter into the kingdom of God and believe and so forth and then be born again? Jesus says you have to be born again before you can enter the kingdom of heaven. That which is born of the flesh is flesh in natural birth. That which is born of the Spirit in the new birth is spirit. And then he goes on to say, but the Spirit or the, or the wind, he's using what's called double entendre here, the idea that the wind, the word for wind and the word for spirit in the Greek is the same word. The wind blows where it wishes. The spirit breathes where he wills. You hear the sound of it, but don't know where he comes from and where it is going. That's the way the spirit operates. He breathes this breath of life where and when he wills and into whom he wills, granting the new birth, giving a sight of the kingdom, allowing somebody to enter into the kingdom through the new birth. This is how the Lord does it. This is that extra thing that needs to be there before somebody can actually see that Jesus is more than a mere man, more than a prophet, before they can enter into the kingdom of heaven. So you can only go so far yourself. You can only bring others so far with the gospel. God has to bring them the rest of the way through His Holy Spirit. And by the way, both of these things need to work together. You need to bring the truth. God needs to do this work. So again, let me ask you the diagnostic question this morning. For you personally first, what do you think about Jesus? Who do you say that He is? Now today, opinions vary. Again, some think He was a great moral teacher. Some think He was a prophet. On the more negative end of things, some would say that he was crazy. Others think that he was a liar. Uh, some believe he didn't exist at all, that he was just made up by the church. There's a lot of people in churches who believe that. Don't be deceived into thinking because a person goes to a church that he's necessarily being taught the truth. The big mainline churches, many of them, have liberal pastors who believe that he is just a fiction. But what about you? What do you believe? Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, that He is the Messiah? Do you believe that He is the Son of the living God? Have you trusted Jesus Christ for your salvation? Have you confessed Jesus Christ as Peter and his disciples, as every true believer? If you have done this, then you are 
safe. You are born again. You are in the kingdom of heaven, and you will not be lost. But you do have to hear this warning this morning. If you believe anything less than this, if you believe Jesus is anything less than the Messiah and the Son of God, one day you may find out the hard way that Jesus is, in fact, who he said he was. You must believe, not just with your mind, but with your heart, that Jesus is the Messiah. You must trust him. If you do not believe that, and if you do not turn from your sins, you will perish. That's what the Bible says in no uncertain terms. And so my prayer for you, if that is your situation, and what our prayer should be for those who have not yet seen Jesus as they ought to see them, is that the Lord would reveal his son to you and would draw you to himself and grant that gift, that blessing of the new birth without which you cannot see him. May the Lord grant that mercy. And by the way, do pray for the people you know that don't know Jesus Christ. You need to bring more than the gospel to them, but the only way you can do that is through prayer. Make sure you pray and ask God to draw them, to teach them, to reveal his son to them, to send the spirit, to grant the new birth so that their eyes would be opened and that they might be able to enter the kingdom through faith in Jesus Christ. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to apply that word to our lives this morning.